So, um, and in this sense, I also adapted my presentation a little bit. So it's a tutorial-like talk. Um, you can be part of this tutorial. So you see here this uh, WooClap link. It's a little bit um, like the uh, mentee that was shown before. Um, I use this WooClap, so I encourage all the participants to actually connect to this. There will be some questions uh, sprinkled throughout this um, presentation. Uh, I see there are some of the first folks coming in. Uh, and um, the beginning would be to introduce yourself and write a little bit on uh, where you come from, what is your major um, uh, field, physics, chemistry, and, and so on and so forth. Um, moving on, um, the next point would be um, this, the overview of this tutorial. So again, your participation is highly encouraged. Uh, just connect uh, to, to this link. Uh, it is, of course, completely anonymous, so no worries that um, you will be graded or uh, judged by your answers here. Um, we will begin with a couple of uh, methods and uh, concepts, uh, beginning with interfaces in uh, PV, and then I will uh, discuss direct and inverse photo emission spectroscopy, uh, in short PES, IPES. Uh, we will then, in the second part, move on to electronic properties at the metal halide perovskite surface. So this is really the um, uh, bare um, exposed uh, surface of the perovskite, what are the energetics, what are band onsets, uh, and also can we actually uh, measure band structure on uh, single crystals. Eventually we will come to the, uh, the holy grail, what is actually the interface formation, what does the interface formation in metal halide perovskite solar cells look like? Uh, can we determine energy level alignment? Um, are there conflicting messages? And if so, we might want to consider interface chemistry. All right, so now let's see if I can um, get this uh, WooClap uh, thing correct here. So I will actually now share with you this outcome by going to uh, this view graph here. See, we have a, a strong uh, preference in the physics uh, for the backgrounds. Uh, I would now be able to um, actually move on to the next question, which is kind of a little uh, warm up, uh, but also here, um, also like to highlight that we see there are uh, a lot of different uh, topics and, and fields that are um, at the interface for the topic of uh, perovskite solar cells. Now, as I said, this is a, a little warm up question that you now see in your WOOC lab. Um, and that is um, really, what is the Fermi level of a solid state body? So um, this is a concept that we uh, use a lot, quasi-Fermi level splitting is also uh, a term that you um, come across a lot. Um, so, so it's quite fundamental, but it's also a bit tricky. So these are the four different answers that you can put in. Is it the thermodynamic work required to add one electron to the body? Um, actually, you can um, check multiple uh, right answers here. Is it the energy difference between the highest and lowest occupied single particle state of non-interacting fermions at 0k? Is it the hypothetical energy level of an electron with 50% probability of being occupied at thermodynamic equilibrium? Or is it the surface and reciprocal space which separates occupied from unoccupied electron states at zero temperature? So I give you 30 seconds to log in your answer. Don't be shy. As I said, there are no points. Um, uh, 30 seconds is short, uh, so maybe you want to use your intuition as well. Okay. Okay. So 10 more seconds to go, and then I will read the correct answers. This actually also helps me a little bit to, to gauge um, your, your background and so that we actually uh, speak the same language here. Okay. So we see that uh, most of you uh, got it right. So there are actually two um, definitions that are uh, right. So the, the true definition is really the thermodynamic work required to add one electron to the body. But if you check this one, um, you were also perfectly right because um, the uh, this hypothetical energy level um, applies uh, in, in, in full to a semiconductor sample where um, the uh, in order to, to ionize the material, you actually, actually need extra energy, um, total of, um, uh, totaling the ionization energy. Uh, there were two false flags here, the energy difference between the highest and lowest unoccupied states. Uh, this is the Fermi energy that is not to be confused with the Fermi level. Um, uh, to be quite uh, frank, this is a basic concept in quantum mechanics, uh, whereas um, the surface and reciprocal space um, uh, separating occupied and occupied, unoccupied states is the Fermi surface. Uh, so that is perfectly uh, fine. Um, if you feel uh, not 
quite comfortable with these concepts, I can highly recommend to, to go back to some um, older literature, which um, um, bring this point across very um, uh, uh, very well. You also notice this small clap um, icon here, which means that this is a running book lab. Okay, let's go back to the um, presentation. For this, I actually need to um, again share my screen over here. Um, and we now begin with concepts and the methods. Uh, so, hold on, I actually have a little bit of an issue here. Okay, this is, should be better. <clears throat> if we um, think about interfaces in um, perovskite solar cells, um, there are always these uh, technological goals that are efficiency, reliability, and scalability. The big promise of perovskite photovoltaics is that we can integrate it into tandem solar cells, for instance, with CIGS, as uh, shown here by Marco Jusch et al., uh, in uh, silicon uh, subcells or even in perovskite perovskite uh, tandems. Uh, critical to this is um, the interfacial design and also using tailored interlayers. As you can see, there are a lot of different interfaces in these um, layer stacks. And uh, one question that I always ask myself is, why, for instance, do we need the nickel oxide over here? Uh, uh, couldn't we use any other oxide? Do we need an oxide at all? Um, the approach that we usually go in order to uh, reveal the properties of these uh, layers is um, uh, here depicted in this trifecta, starting over with um, interface spectroscopy. I will explain in a second what that is uh, or what I mean by this term. It's a little bit loosely phrased, I must admit. Uh, photophysics, so um, uh, absorption, um, emission, uh, and, and the um, UV vis, for instance, and device characterization. Now, this is talk here is really focused on the interface spectroscopy. The most uh, basic aspect that you probably came across is UPS, XPS, or also IPS. There are some uh, more advanced uh, photoemission spectroscopy methods like angle resolved photoemission spectroscopy or photoemission spectroscopy using hard X-rays. And there are also some um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy techniques that are used to determine interface properties and electronic states at the, um, uh, at the surface of materials. Now, uh, when it comes to, to interfaces in PV, um, I want to very um, quickly highlight the, um, um, the need for, um, on, on why we really care about this. So this is a very, very simplified device, um, way more um, simple than what um, Thomas um, uh, and, and, and Piers presented earlier. Um, uh, you should see here this absorber layer sandwich between the top and the bottom contact. Uh, on the right hand side of the energy diagram. So I, I didn't even bother to put in any causal Fermi level splitting. So this here is basically at uh, short circuit current uh, conditions and uh, short circuit conditions uh, with uh, zero voltage. So there's currently no power output here. Uh, nonetheless, we can use this concept to understand a bit on what are key properties we want to look at at the interface. First, of course, we have photo excitation and lossless transport of carriers to the interfaces. Uh, this is then followed by um, the um, extraction of carriers from the um, absorber layer into the contact. And what could happen here is that you have a misalignment of electronic bands that cause a barrier for extraction um, and can lead to subsequent uh, recombination. So um, uh, uh, speaking of recombination, we should also know that the um, interface is actually the largest defect in a um, solid state uh, body. So per definition, it's uh, the, the 2D dimensionality breaks with the um, uh, 3D um, band structure. Uh, you can induce a lot of um, different um, defect types, dangling bonds, um, uh, classical examples in silicon, uh, for instance, that can induce states that are in the middle of the gap and therefore act as recombination sites. And then um, another point is about um, the um, carriers residing in the interfacial region. And when you have um, carriers of opposite sign also residing at this contact interface, which you usually want to avoid by introducing the blocking layer, for instance, uh, then you can have back recombination that is again detrimental to the um, properties. Um, I believe that we will have a way more detailed look into this um, tomorrow um, in the um, presentation from uh, Uber Raut. Now, um, what does it, or how can we know energy level alignment in a perovskite solar cell? Um, I want to um, demonstrate this at this view graph here that um, uh, Thomas brought up um, earlier from also from my uh, table of content figure. Uh, we will actually see this here a lot. So it's the uh, perovskite sandwich between a titanium oxide ETL and an organic HTL. Um, and back at the time, um, we wanted to know wh what is the electronic band gap? Would it be different from the optical band gap? Uh, well, it, it isn't for um, 
metal halide perovskites uh, because exciton binding energies are rather small. But um, coming from organic electronics, this was not that obvious um, to me at least. Uh, where would be the conduction band minimum situated on the electron affinity of the material? Where would we see the um, valence band maximum and uh, what would be the ionization energy? Now, um, then when you start interfacing this material to an organic layer, for instance, uh, you can have in, um, dipoles at the interface that um, uh, manifest in an offset of the vacuum level. So um, this offset here could then determine where we um, place the um, highest occupied molecular orbital or hole transport level in the organic. and could therefore affect on how easy we could extract holes from the perovskite into the organic hole transport layer. Now, um, wouldn't it be great if we had an experimental setup to measure the band structure of a solid? Um, and so Bruno gave a little bit away my um, background, which is um, in, in physics uh, that I uh, studied in um, Aachen in, in, in Germany. Um, I uh, back then was setting up a UHV or dry vacuum cluster tool with um, different evaporation and um, analysis techniques, um, also UPS XPS. Uh, so, uh, and of course, we, I had friends in the physics department that were looking at other materials. So why do I bring up this lengthy story? Because I'd like to um, have you behold the miracle that is the German language, because he frankly asked me, hey, Philip, I got these oxides, and I heard you've got a bunch of to a mess gerät. So, of course, you can all uh, mesh this sentence into one single um, German uh, word that um, captures the essence. Um, don't, don't worry, it's not a real word, but uh, that's how we actually approach me. And then um, the um, correct answer is, of course, yes, there is a um, means to, to um, analyze band structure um, directly, experimentally, using photoelectron, um, also referred to as photoemission spectroscopy, or in short, PES. And um, this now leads us view of photo emission spectroscopy that I would like to give you um, what is actually happening here. You see the basic uh, configuration starting with a sample surface. We shine light, the monochromatic light actually of um, energy H nu on the surface and uh, emit electrons that are then captured um, through this uh, lens system and analyzer. I'll give you a closer view on the um, uh, inside of this in a second. Uh, and we measure actually the kinetic energy of this um, uh, emitted electron. Now the um, uh, photo excited electrons, photoelectrons, um, uh, it's um, uh, following the basic concept of the photoelectric effect by Einstein, uh, carry information on the binding energy and that the um, kinetic energy of the electron is equal to the excitation energy. So the excess energy that you give the electron minus the binding energy that is required to, um, uh, to, to um, remove the electron from its binding position in the solid. This um, distribution of the photoelectron then yields a direct projection of the density of states of occupied states, right? So uh, this is actually an important detail. The um, uh, states need to be occupied with electrons in order for the electrons to be emitted into the vacuum. Uh, this is the very, very uh, basic concept. Uh, of course, uh, the, the entire process is a bit more complicated. I um, don't want to lose you in details here, but give you um, um, just a little bit of a um, perspective on, on what is required. Um, the um, photoelectron distribution from um, excitation can be um, calculated from uh, according to Fermi's uh, golden rule, where you have the um, transition dipole um, matrix um, element here, the delta function ensuring that um, you are um, that energies are preserved with uh, the final state and initial state uh, in, with respect to the excitation energy. This is really the basis for a so-called three-step model, where you have your electron in your initial state, you excite it to this final state. The electron, here now a free wave packet, travels or to the surface in the second step, and then in the third step is emitted. And there are loss mechanisms related to this travel to the surface. We um, usually neglect those, but um, be aware they are not always neglectable. Uh, you, you, these are mostly electron-electron interactions, um, and there are also um, electron exciton interactions, electron plasma um, interactions that also lead to um, additional features that you would technically also calculate, uh, need to calculate to get your um, true primary electron um, contrary, um, distribution. Um, the transmission through the surface is critical if you run um, angle resolved experiments where you need to um, uh, think of the um, conservation of um, momentum. Now, um, the three-step model, however, 
call it, and it is in that also a little bit inaccurate. Um, it's actually, it's actually uh, from a theoretical perspective, uh, more sustainable to use a one-step model where you excite the um, entire system directly from a ground state into an excited state uh, within one step. And here you have now this um, uh, dampened wave um, from the initial um, uh, electron wave or the bound electron plus the a wave matching at the surface for the electron in vacuum. Um, this is a very convoluted process, however, and needs to capture also the joint density of states. Um, however, you can then more easily get the wave vector um, dependence for um, angular distribution. Now, what does it actually um, look like? Uh, what you see here is um, the um, system in which uh, we uh, measured for um, the, the first time the complete set of direct and inverse photo emission spectra of metal halide uh, perovskites. That's the uh, lab of Antoine Kahn at uh, Princeton University. Um, and what is behind this is really in the direct photo emissions um, spectroscopy process, as I explained, you shine light on the sample and collect the electrons. Whereas in the inverse photo emission spec, um, uh, process, you shine or shoot low kinetic energy electrons on the surface and collect light from um, the electrons that fall into unoccupied states and then uh, recombine radiatively. Uh, if you take those two together, um, now you uh, go beyond the classical photo emission spectroscopy techniques that gives you the occupied states and therefore valence band maximum. Uh, but with the inverse photo emission process, you also see the unoccupied states uh, that lets you directly assess the connection uh, conduction band minimum. I should also mention that in um, uh, with UPS XPS, you can assess the work function. And this process is um, a bit more. Um, I, I will just uh, lay this out in detail on, on how you get to the work function. But once you have this value, together with the valence band maximum position, you get the ionization energy. Whereas combining the work function with the conduction band minimum, you can measure the electron affinity. It's um, uh, essentially seen here. Again, the um, work function is actually the distance between the Fermi level that would be somewhere here in the gap to the vacuum level in order to uh, have this 50% probability to um, eject an electron into vacuum. Now the bottom of the conduction band with the distance to the vacuum level is then the electron affinity. So if you have this distance between this hypothetical Fermi level here and the conduction band, and you have your uh, vacuum level uh, by making the um, sum of this, you get the electron affinity. And also if you take those two together, you get the electronic band gap um, directly assessed as a single particle gap without any um, additional excitonic effects. Now I uh, promised to show you a little bit on the inner workings um, and instrumentation of an uh, UPS XPS um, spectrometer. So um, this is actually taken from a book chapter that uh, we uh, recently um, uh, wrote in this uh, new book from uh, Mufak al Yassim and Nancy Hager from NREL about advanced characterization of thin film solar cells. If you're interested in how to use photoelectron spectroscopy methods and um, also the peculiarity really for um, uh, research on PV systems, uh, you, can, you can look this up. But um, let's uh, look at this internal instrumentation. Uh, the sample is ne needs to be put on a um, specific potential. Usually you ground it, but sometimes you need to give it a bit of more um, extra energy. So you apply a bias when you measure work functions. Uh, the um, uh, vessel of the um, analyzer is also put uh, to, to ground. Um, and then you have the two critical parts here. This is the inner hemisphere of uh, uh, with voltage one and the outer hemisphere with voltage two. Um, may, um, actually resembling now a capacitor with a field li lines that look like this and put the electrons that are emitted from the samples focused and collimated in this beam um, across this um, spectrometer on this trajectory. If electrons are too fast, so their kinetic energy is too high, they will crash in this outer hemisphere. If they are too slow, they will crash into this inner hemisphere. So you actually, um, the spectrometer um, uh, gives you this um, spatial dispersion of electrons of different energy, here indicated by different colors from low energy to high energy, and then imping on the detector. If you have a multi-channel plate, you can also use this um, dispersion in addition to, um, uh, to, to cycle through the um, spectrum. Uh, what is the most um, uh, useful tool how, or, or how it's uh, usually done in order to cover large energy ranges is to change the retardation of these electrons. 
Um, there are two techniques, ultraviolet photoemission spectroscopy, usually using five to 50 AB excitation energy gives you valence band information. And then there's X-ray photoemission spectroscopy, XPS, also in um, most of the older literature referred to as ESCA, so um, electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis, where you use a higher um, energy range, giving you also access to core level information. And as the um, other um, acronym that I indicated, uh, chemical uh, tool for chemical analysis. Now, um, you can also assess valence band information with XPS. It's just that the resolution is a little bit worse. Um, and then also sometimes the photoionization cross section. Um, the instrumentation for inverse photoemission spectroscopy is also within a vacuum vessel. You can see here from these uh, uh, blueprint that um, the um, distances between the sample and the various components, the electron gun and the detector um, are very small. That's because uh, the um, yield is very, uh, uh, it's much, much smaller in IPS compared to PES. So it's on the order of one thousandth of signal to noise ratio, uh, which means you really need to um, have every electron that is impinging on the sample uh, generate this um, uh, light and collect the light by moving the detector very closely. Um, here you see it a bit more conceptually. Usually you um, change the um, kinetic energy of the incoming electrons and then have a bandpass filter that's let through only uh, light of a specific energy, usually in the um, uh, UV range. Um, and then after a photomultiplier, you detect this as you scan through the electron um, energies. And as I said earlier, this gives you an um, insight into the conduction band information. Now I uh, promise to um, show you on how to actually extract the work function from um, UPS spectra. This is something that you uh, will see time and again in um, publications. So um, let's take the time and, uh, and go through this. What you see here is the spectrum of a gold surface. So plain gold, nothing exciting. Um, there are a few features that um, directly should, could catch your eye immediately. First here at zero, this is um, the um, actual Fermi level. Everything here is reference to the Fermi level. You see the small Fermi edge. And this is really now where we can determine the Fermi level for the spectrometer system as well. Then you have these occupied B bands over here, followed by this large tail that is increasing in intensity. Now, these are secondary electrons, whereas I initially said um, the main information is from electrons that are not scattered, these here underwent a lot of inelastic um, scattering, mostly with other electrons, um, and lead to this additional signal, which doesn't carry any binding energy information anymore. Now, it's often referred to um, this edge here as the secondary electron cutoff. So this is the um, uh, lowest or the deepest binding energy for which an electron from, um, still escapes the, sur um, the surface, which means from here, from the seeker, we can actually project the excitation energy leading to the vacuum level. So this electron here can be projected out of the um, solid. Electrons that would come later wouldn't make it and are thus below the vacuum level here. So um, with this measurement, we can determine the work function of a surface system. Now, per definition, the distance now between the Fermi level and the vacuum level makes the work function. So this looks nice and square for a metal. Um, of course, for a semiconductor, you would not have intensity here at the Fermi level. The Fermi level is in the gap. So you would see some um, tailing of over here. Uh, and this now uh, should lead me to um, some important uh, trivia where um, that you need to know when you want to run these type of experiments. First of all, this needs to be done in ultra high vacuum, uh, meaning that uh, electrons must not be scattered by um, um, gas um, species. Uh, you need magnetic shielding, otherwise you will change the trajectories of your um, electrons. And the sample needs to be conductive. Um, if you emit electrons, you would otherwise see charging and this charging would put your Fermi level to some arbitrary um, position. Now, one very critical point that I did, but, um, gave it away by always referring to the surface, is that this technique is very, very surface sensitive. So in UPS, um, the surface sensitivity amounts to one to two nanometers as an information depth. In XPS, you can go up to five to 10 nanometers. In Huxpass, it's actually way more. And in IPS, also two to 10 nanometers. Now, why is this? Um, it's actually not um, the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, attenuation of photons that are coming into the sample. So those have um, several um, microns usually, well, for the UV light, that's not quite true. Uh, but 
a much larger um, uh, 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 penetration part ways. Um, it's rather the electron scattering given by the inelastic mean free path. Um, he's seeing um, for the universal curve um, that was been reported, has been reported by CN Dench. Uh, we are here with kinetic energies on the order of 20 EV for um, classical U, um, UPS experiments. And you see that the inelastic mean free path is below one nanometer. So um, you only see here the first couple of um, nanometers of your material. Now, um, why it's difficult to use these tools to really get the bulk density of state, it is, however, quite um, useful to, to use this restriction um, to reconstruct energy diagrams. Okay, um, maybe a last word here about the um, um, about the um, resolution limits. Uh, usually the analyzer is not a limit to the resolution. It's rather the UV discharge lamp or um, the X-ray sources that give a finite resolution to the lines that you record, um, plus of course any temperature effects. But at synchrotron, you can push those to a few millielectron volts, which is uh, very useful once you look at um, uh, exotic systems like um, topological insulators, for instance. So we do have a clap here. Let's see on where this leads us. I will um, now move to the next uh, WooClap Club question, which is um, just a very short check on um, what we um, can measure with X-ray photo emission spectroscopy or XPS. So um, can it be employed to measure the full electronic structure of a solid state body? There are four answers that are possible. Only one is correct. Answer one is yes, we can measure the complete electronic structure. Two would be, no, only the properties of occupied states are accessible um, via XPS. Three would be no, we can only measure energy level positions. And four would be no, not the entire electronic structure, but we can assess the effective mass of electrons. Okay, so um, I leave you with uh, about 30 seconds starting from now to answer this before I reveal the correct answers. So we have about 17, 18 answers yet, 20. Give you a little bit more time. <clears throat> again, you can, if you don't know, you can also use your intuition. And I want to reveal right now, correct answer is two. We can probe with XPS only the properties of occupied states. Um, we can, um, so there was a few answers on um, energy level positions, that is true, but we actually get a little bit more um, with um, dispersion of states, for instance. And then there were some that said, maybe we can measure the effective mass of electrons. So um, you were on a, on a right track that yes, we can measure effective masses by checking the curvature um, at um, specific points in um, K space and reciprocal space, um, but only for occupied species, not for electrons. So we can measure the effective mass of holes, but not electrons. All right, we move back to the presentation and actually to a small exercise that I have prepared and that should show up right now. Okay, for this, I'll give you a, a couple of minutes, but um, it's a very important exercise as I found. It takes us a little bit back to, um, um, OPV, so I can already reveal these are organic materials. Um, and we have two materials here, um, the red one, curve A, and um, the blue one, um, curve B. And I would like to know from you, so uh, what is the ionization energy of each of these materials? What is the electron affinity? What is the band gap? And then maybe if you get these rights, then there's a minimal chance that you also get the actual materials. Um, uh, so these are like four letter um, abbreviations, each of them. Um, note that here in these spectra, um, there's a, um, an important change to, to, to really distinct, uh, make it distinct from what I showed you earlier. Here, the binding energy is not referenced to the Fermi level anymore, but to the vacuum level, which means the, um, the work function has already been determined in UPS and everything has been shifted so that the vacuum level is at zero. Uh, we don't know from this plot where the Fermi level is in the gap. Um, so it's now up to you to determine the ionization energy um, Affinity and band gap. And I do have this in the next uh, WooClap that is um, now open.
and I let you do this for um, a total of uh, three minutes. Um, don't want to eat up too much time of our discussion later on, uh, but I think it's actually useful, um, uh, a, a useful exercise. So the first person already locked in their answers. About a minute and a half to go. Okay, um, and unfortunately you cannot put in the answer separately, so you have to log in everything at the same time. Um, but I want to reveal in a, a few seconds. So um, if you just submit now on uh, where you're at so far, um, that'd be great. Okay, so three folks have already responded completely, four, five, Okay, seven, eight, okay, now everything's coming in here. Okay, give it 10 more seconds, 10, nine, eight. Obviously these are not perfect. <laughs> All right, so um, let's have a look at the correct answers right now. 15 folks have participated. Okay, so uh, we have that um, the ionization energy of the first materials is six EV, so here you can see this would be, I, I barely made it to, <laughs> to, to hide this, uh, um, this, this dash that was here before. Um, and you can read it off directly as the difference on this axis to the vacuum level. Um, the uh, conduction band minimum would be here at 3.6. For the blue material, now this is a bit more difficult. You can barely see it in this blue curve here. So they magnified it by a factor of three to better read it off here at about 4.7. And then here the, um, uh, uh, electron affinity is actually at 2.1, uh, it should be, uh, yes. So the band gap, of course, is the distance between those two. So it amounts to 2.4 up here and 2.6 down here. And uh, the materials we were looking for, unfortunately, you don't have this one right. Uh, but again, so this is uh, like a bonus, bonus joker question. Are ICBA electron material based on a fullerene acceptor and P3HD, a typical um, donor polymer used in OPV. So if you want to learn more on how this has been done, there is also the source here. Um, I assume that the slides will be shared at one point in time um, and, and um, how these energy level diagram um, of these two materials was then derived from these measurements. All right, now um, I'm uh, still sharing over here. That is fantastic because now I'd like to move on. 
to the next part. And this is um, now really the um, metal halide perovskite surface electronic properties. So now um, we get to the um, a very most interesting part in my opinion. So um, I mentioned it, interface studies, and I also told you already, I want you that we will see this new graph here a couple of times. I won't go into detail though anymore. Uh, photo emission spectroscopy, UPS, XPS, and IPS can thus be used in order to um, evaluate the surface electronic properties. Now, um, uh, this means that we put the perovskite and whatever uh, stoichiometry we want and composition that we would like to um, analyze on top of a transport layer, which can be different ones. Uh, obviously, the, um, uh, the, the, the next best choice was titanium oxide as it was used in the um, uh, state-of-the-art devices back then. Now, um, what you see here is the UPS helium-1 um, uh, spectra. So, um, Oh, actually, I should explain this. So UPS, of course, means ultraviolet photoemission spectroscopy. Helium-1 is the excitation line. So um, this is uh, uh, the gas discharge lamp that gives you 21.2 um, um, EV excitation of uh, UV photons. Uh, this is sometimes important if you want to um, compare different photoionization cross-sections. Uh, we have these results here for methylmonium lead bromide in red, methylmonium lead iodide in black, and the blue one is a mixture of iodine and chlorine, but um, turns out this is mostly iodide, so we can see this as synonymous for um, iodine with a bit of chlorine additives. We can read off from the secondary electron cutoff the work function, and here on the right, you see that it has been, um, the, the spectra have been referenced to the Fermi level at zero, and there is already something that should raise your suspicion. And this is, um, we would read off the valence band maximum here 1.8 EV. This would mean they are larger than the band gap. Uh, so this is a bit, uh, which is about 1.6 EV. Now, if we add also the zero point, uh, we can read from MAPI, for instance, that um, the conduction band minimum, nicely resolved here, is at around 0 0.3 EV. Together with the work function of 4 EV, uh, we can find the electron affinity to be on the order of 3.7 EV. Now, um, this would give an electronic band gap of 2.1 EV, which is way too large. So if this is an accurate assessment of band onsets, it's um, highly questionable. Um, back then, we, um, in the absence of any better um, uh, method, we um, had a closer look into the very low um, intensities by plotting this on a log scale and um, trying to find a point where we get a significant signal um, coming from the um, uh, from the surface. Um, this is um, technique or here would be, um, it's actually really not standard because it's highly prone to errors. It's mathematically not um, completely sound. Um, the way on how you put your background and how you change your lenses can change the outcome, but it led us to values that were um, more compatible and eventually also led to um, uh, band edges that are uh, excuse me, a band cap of 1.7 for um, NAPI, which was in the margin of error, that is about 100 milli electron volt for this experiment. And we could then also um, map out these energy level diagrams with the titanium oxide being n type, so the Fermi level is close to the conduction band. And um, the results here were that, um, yes, the data is now um, compatible with optical data and also DFT calculations. And the Fermi level in the perovskite film is close to the conduction band when it's deposited on top of nickel, uh, excuse me, on um, titanium oxide. So um, with this, people were um, eager to get a better understanding of this and um, put more effort into the band onset determination. It clearly requires a more rigorous determination of these positions. Um, here you can see um, this experiment again repeated, UPS and IPS on a linear scale and on a log scale, but now actually fitted with a simulated density of states from density functional theory, which would then allow you to determine a band onset if you assume specific broadening and so on and so forth. That here, in the case of methylmonium and bromide, for instance, led to very accurate determination of this um, band gap. Now, the um, uh, key result here is also that um, the density of states here is really very low, which actually prohibits us from making um, this uh, linear fit, which is but really um, puts into consideration this um, uh, low density of uh, states near the valence band edge to better estimate where is the valence band onset really. Now, um, this can be a bit understood a bit better if we go one step further. Um, and at this example, I want to immediately show you also um, how these band structure determinations look like. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, uh, you can't do this for any sample. You actually need a single crystal because you need to translate your um, symmetry um, that you want to map in reciprocal space um, onto a real space. And here in the single crystal where you know exactly the Brillouin zone. Uh, you can um, orient this with lead and then measure the band dispersion with photo, um, angle reserve photo emission spectroscopy. So what you see here are actually electrons in photo emission um, along specific uh, uh, wave uh, vectors from um, high symmetry points here from X to M and here from X to R. And interestingly, the um, a valence band maximum is at the R point and not um, uh, at the X point or um, gamma point, uh, which gives it a much um, smaller photoionization um, cross section in uh, general. You can see that the signal here is also very faint and therefore very hard also on top to detect by photo emission spectroscopy. Um, this was um, uh, so the, the um, group of Norbert Koch and uh, Feng Shui Zhu went a little bit uh, further and um, uh, even determined on, a, on, the, on a linear and logarithmic scale these um, band onsets for different k vectors and could then see that generally the logarithmic um, uh, plot for uh, regardless which wave vector you um, put would give you a, a more um, a compliant reliable result whereas the linear uh, onset would give you very um, um, diverging um, uh, findings and um, particularly when you do the integration, which are regular thin film UPS measurements would be, you can see that then um, the linear fit is really off and the lower logarithmic fit leads you closer to the actual valence band onset. Now, um, this has been done for um, thin based uh, metal halide uh, perovskites. So um, you can see here um, uh, the entire uh, zoo um, of uh, uh, materials um, was done um, in a, a group of um, Selina Althoff um, together with a, a, a researcher as uh, Tao um, uh, from the Netherlands actually, um, and gives you this complete energy um, uh, diagram, um, which they uh, label um, absolute energy level positions. And um, it's a complete um, catalog. Um, you can also make intermediates, of course. This is extremely useful for the design of a device layout and architecture. If you want to know which type of um, transport layer you want to um, uh, sandwich your uh, proscat in between. Now, one question, of course, remains that is, is the interfacial energy level alignment fully covered? And um, for this, I'd actually like to go to a first interface related um, observation. You can see here is the same material in MAPBI3, um, an orange deposited on titanium oxide and in black deposited on nickel oxide. All the structural morphological properties are the same, but what we see is starting over here, the work function of um, the um, titanium oxide, um, MAPI on titanium oxide is 4.0, um, the uh, work function of the um, MAPI on nickel oxide is 4.7. We see a similar um, shift in the core levels here in the valence band onset and in the conduction band onset. So we've seen it, there is a clap, so we move to WooClap right away. And I have a question for you um, concerning um, this observation. And I want you to tell me now, what is the ionization energy of the MAPI-3, so MAPBI-3 thin film on top of titanium oxide? and the ionization energy of the same film on top of nickel oxide. So I give you one minute to, to answer this question before we move on. Little tip, uh, what you need is work function and also the main thing on set. Philip, can I, can I ask how uh, many more slides you have? Um, so I think I've got about uh, 10 more slides, but I will skip uh, some of the more, um, uh, the, the latest uh, slides, so yeah. Okay, it would be great to have some discussion. Fantastic, thanks. Okay, so we've got four answers so far. One more, more. Okay, so I reveal the correct answers. 
it's 4.5 actually in both cases, right? So you just simply add the work function plus the valence band maximum, which gives you 4.5, which means they have the same ionization energy, but the Fermi level in the gap changed depending on um, what um, you use as a bottom substrate. Now, um, whoop, um, let me go back to the um, presentation here. Um, I think in the interest of time, we will actually now um, skip the next um, uh, claps. Uh, so, are we done here? Do we have all the um, uh, information? And the, the answer is actually not. So we can now also, um, we are interested in this energy level alignment by having an um, overlayer deposition. And we'll now step by step build this interface here. And we can probe um, various different overlayers from organic semiconductors to um, carbon nanotubes or oxides. Um, and I want to, um, this is then also the, the last um, aspect that I really want to share here <clears throat> is that. Um, um, here you see the um, um, stitch together um, UPS and IPS measurements of MAPVI3. So you basically have seen this data already a couple of slides ago. And now by the step-by-step -step assessment, we build this energy diagram. So we deposit five angstrom of spiromyotide on top. We see that there's actually no change in the work function, which means that there is no interface dipole forming. And then we can also measure the HOMO level onset here. That is about uh, one um, electron volt. Uh, meaning that we have, don't have any um, barrier um, to extract holes from the um, uh, perovskite onto the spiral. We now um, evaporate more spiral on top um, and can see that there's a shift of this um, HOMO level onset and also of the work function um, indicating the slight um, downward band bending. In the end, we also took an IPES scan in order to see the LUMO level position of the spiral to complete um, this picture. So the result is that there is no interface dipole and also no um, hole extraction barrier. Now, um, what is a little bit unclear is if there are no changes to the perovskite and we, uh, actually this can also be monitored by using XPS. So we now um, uh, disregard the uh, UPS measurements and only focus on the core levels that are um, related to the perovskite itself themselves. And you can see that there's actually no change in this core level position, meaning that the Fermi level inside of the perovskite as you build this interface is not moving at all. Um, and of course, this now was the big question if this measured energy level offset was relevant for um, perovskite solar cells. Um, and now let me put this as a last um, explanation slide. Uh, we, we thought initially that this is um, uh, an offset that could limit the open circuit voltage. Um, it turns out that um, initially people tried to sample um, materials with different ionization energy to change this offset and could see that yes, if you align this better, you might get a higher open circuit voltage. Uh, but later on, this was actually disproven and um, we actually don't see a huge impact there. Only if your valence band maximum is too deep, you get this S-shaped kink. So there is actually no apparent impact of the VOC of this type of alignment on, um, um, but if the ionization energy of your whole transport layer is too large, it will create an interface barrier and uh, decrease the short circuit current and fill factor, similar to the um, uh, point that um, Thomas uh, raised earlier today. Okay, and uh, with this, I will actually skip the rest. Um, if you are interested, you of course have the slides and I will um, um, just mention that chemistry is also quite important for um, this. So um, we see a lot of interface chemistry affecting also on how we um, need to take these measurements. Uh, so, but these are a couple um, only details. And if you're interested in this topic more, there's um, this review article that I can uh, recommend. And also if you are um, particularly inter interested in photo emission spectroscopy, for perovskite materials, then we have this uh, uh, newer um, uh, review piece. Okay, so um, that's it.